Hey guys, what's up? I'm Erin and welcome back to the channel. The biggest question we all tend to ask in personal finance is how much do I need? How much do I need in order to be able to retire? How much do I need to reach financial freedom? How much do I need to not be reliant on a paycheck? Which I think all of these circle back to meaning the same thing. How much do I need to retire? And this video is honestly a little bit nostalgic for me because I made a video with this same title several years back. I actually posted that video and then shortly after I quit YouTube. But this video is actually the reason I came back to YouTube. And really my favorite topic in the financial space is retirement. Now, when I discussed this topic before, I approached it from the stance of what individual financial professionals say you need in order to live life without a paycheck. But this time, I want to approach it a little bit differently. This time, rather than talking about a specific number that you need to get to, I want to approach it from the stance of what your accumulation should look like throughout the course of your working career, and ultimately, what number should you be aiming to get to. If you followed my channel for any length of time now, or if you're one of the few who been with me since I first posted that original video. First of all, I want to say a huge thank you and I appreciate you hanging with me for all these years. But you might notice a theme. When I talk about personal finance, I tend to talk about a lot of different perspectives. And I do that deliberately because I don't think any one person has all the answers. I think there's a lot of really wonderful professionals out there with really wonderful guidance, but I don't believe in a one-size-fits-all approach. So I think it's best to kind of hear about all the these different approaches so you can be more informed and make better decisions for your finances because ultimately you're going to need your own plan to reach your own personal goals. Often when we talk about saving and investing, you'll hear numbers like you should be setting aside 10, 15, 20, or maybe all the way up to 25% of your income into savings and investments to actually reach your goal. And I think these numbers can be useful if you look at them as being on a spectrum. Maybe if you're saving 10%, that's on the low end. If you're saving 25%, that's on the high end. And with most spectrums, most of us are going to fall in the middle. If you aim to save 15 or 20% of your income, that's probably going to be the sweet spot or a more realistic goal for most people. So let's say that you're hitting these savings metrics, or maybe you're even surpassing them. That still leaves you with the question, where should I be with my investments? One of the most often cited guidelines is the guideline from Fidelity, where they say you should have one times your salary saved up by the time you're 30, three times by the time you're 40, six times by the time you're 50, working your way all the way up to 10 times your income by the time you reach the age of 67. And this approach is really based on a traditional retirement at full retirement age, 67. Fidelity does offer the amendment that if you want to retire early, at say the age of 62, they suggest having 14 times your annual income saved up. Or at the age of 65, they suggest having 12 times your annual income. And if you want to do a delayed retirement at the age of 70, at that point, you would only need eight times your salary saved up. You'll notice with this guideline and the following guidelines that they follow this pattern of exponential growth. And that is quite simply because of compound interest. In the beginning, it's you doing a lot of the legwork, you contributing the most to the bulk that makes up your portfolio. It's actually the investment returns that are making up a very small portion of your portfolio. However, as you get more investing years under your belt, as that balance gets a little bit larger, that's when you really start to notice this exponential growth. That's when compounding takes over. That's when you notice interest becoming a larger percentage of your portfolio. That's when you notice each milestone gets a little bit easier to hit and comes a little bit quicker. Let's throw some numbers into the mix for the Fidelity Guidelines. If you have a $50,000 a year salary, they're suggesting by the time you're 30, you would have one times your annual income saved up or $50,000. By the time you hit 40, they would expect you to have $150,000 saved up. By the time you hit 50, they'd want that balance to be about $300,000. And by the time you reach full retirement age, or 67, you'd want to have 10 times your annual income. In this situation, that'd be $500,000. It's worth noting that the Fidelity Guidelines only assume investable assets, so they don't take into account any non-investable assets, for example, like the value of your home. They also assume that you are drawing Social Security in retirement. 
So if you retire at 67, Fidelity assumes that roughly 45% of your income would come from your investments, from which you could use a withdrawal rate of up to 4.5%, and the remaining percentage of your income would actually come from Social Security. This table can actually be really helpful. It shows that Fidelity assumes that a greater percentage of your income is going to have to come from your investments the earlier you retire, and to be on the conservative side, that you would want to use a less aggressive withdrawal rate, and likewise that Social Security payout would be smaller. Whereas if you were to do a delayed retirement, you could use a more aggressive withdrawal rate and would need a lesser replacement from your investments themselves, as your Social Security payout would be higher. If we use our previous example of someone with a pre-retirement income of $50,000 and say they hit those Fidelity recommended benchmarks and by the age of 67, they have $500,000 saved up in investable assets. Well, at this point, they could use a withdrawal rate of 4.5%, giving them an income of $22,500 a year. The remainder of the gap is to be filled by Social Security. Presently, the average benefit for someone claiming Social Security at the age of 67 is $1,782 per month, or just over $21,000 a year. So taken together, this type of withdrawal combined with Social Security is going to get you pretty darn close to your pre-retirement income. It's also worth noting that Fidelity says they only need about 80% of your pre-retirement income once you reach retirement, because most retirees tend to spend less than they did during their working years. Next, let's consider what your savings and investing milestones might look like through the years from data presented by Sam over at Financial Samurai. Now, Sam definitely follows the approach of being a super saver on the quest for financial independence. He has the belief that your ultimate goal is to save at least 20 times your annual expenses or annual gross income by the time you no longer want to work. He goes on to say, I recommend everybody start off with saving 10% and raise their savings amount by 1% each month until it hurts. Saying, if it doesn't hurt, you're not saving enough. From here, he developed this table on the savings ranges you want to hit based off your age bracket. Starting out in your early 20s, you likely have nothing saved up. But as you work through your 20s and work towards ramping up your savings rate, remember, save till it hurts, you'll work towards having anywhere from 0.5 to 1.5 times your income saved up at 30. As you close out your 30s, you'd want to be anywhere from 3 to 6 times your salary saved up. As you close out your 40s, you'd want to have anywhere from 6 to 10 times your income. As you hone in on 60, you'd want to have anywhere from 8 to 15 times your annual income saved up. And if you're a super saver, be getting very close to hitting 20 times your income in investable assets. It's also worth noting that he has labeled these phases of life, the accumulation phase, crunch time, which hits right before you enter into retirement planning, and ultimately entering into retirement, which is actually a decumulation phase where you work on spending everything you worked so hard to build up. Something I really like about this table that he created is that he gives a range of investable assets that you should have saved up. I like ranges better than I like one specific set amount. For instance, with his table, assuming a $65,000 income at the age of 40, he says you should have anywhere from $195,000 all the way up to $390,000 saved up. And yes, this is a big range, but I think the range is more useful because quite frankly, we all have different aspirations with money. Some people want to simply save up enough to cover their expenses and that's it. If that's you, aim to be on the lower end of this range. Other people want to be super savers. If that's you, aim to be on the higher end of this range. But I think a range allows for all types to exist. So if you want to use this table and tailor it to your situation, all you have to do is take your income, find your age bracket, and multiply it by the ratios. If you're in this range, then that says you're on target. So again, if we look at this chart, Sam used a $65,000 income in his example. If you look at the 31 to 35 year old range, to get this range, he simply multiplied 65,000 times one for the low end of the range and 65,000 times four to get 260,000 or the high end range. So for your situation, simply find the ratios for your age bracket and replace it with your income. 
T. Rowe Price also utilizes a range when it comes to investing targets. The T. Rowe Price benchmark savings as a multiple of income are very similar to those utilized by Fidelity, but you might actually notice that theirs are just a little bit less aggressive in the earlier years and have you aiming to hit a higher multiple of income in the later years. This type of path actually more accurately follows the traditional compounding curve, which I think can be a bit more realistic and more encouraging because those very first benchmarks of hitting 1x or 2x your income are incredibly difficult because like I said in the beginning it's you doing a lot of the legwork you building up this portfolio on your own but as your portfolio gets bigger and compounding starts to take over it becomes easier to hit each sequential multiple of income in investments it might be worth noting they assume an investor starts saving 6% at the age of 25 and ramps up saving by one percentage point each year until reaching an appropriate level. We found that 15% of income per year, including any employer contribution, is an appropriate savings level for many people, but we recommend that high earners aim beyond 15%. I also really like the ranges used in the T. Rowe Price methodology. Again, I feel like having these target ranges rather than one specific target allows for an approach that can be more personalized because how much you need to save is going to depend so heavily on your own personal circumstances. For instance, if you enter into retirement with a fully paid off home, you're probably going to need far less in investments than someone who goes into retirement with a mortgage. Likewise, if you go into retirement with a pension, you're going to need less in investments than someone who doesn't have a pension in retirement. I feel like there's so many factors at play that a range is really the only appropriate way to handle this. Let's throw some numbers into the mix for the T. Rowe Price example. Let's say we have an individual with a $50,000 a year income aiming for retirement at the age of 65. While T. Rowe Price would suggest that this individual should have anywhere from $375,000 all the way up to $675,000 in investable assets. Again, just like the Fidelity example, this financial institution only looks at investable assets. They don't look at non-investable assets like your home value. They also assume that you're drawing Social Security in your retirement years. They do break down these multiples even further based on marital status and household incomes at age 55, age 60, and age 65. I think this chart can be really helpful, so if you're interested in this one, you can hit pause on the video or you can select the link down below. Finally, we have one quick equation that was developed by Dr. Thomas Stanley, the author of the book, The Millionaire Next Door. This is an absolutely legendary book in the personal finance space. And while it is several decades old at this point, it still provides invaluable insights to the lifestyle of the everyday millionaire. But rather than using a multiple of income or a table, he developed an equation. He suggests using this equation to determine if you are a prodigious accumulator of wealth, an average accumulator of wealth, or an under accumulator of wealth. Quite simply, the formula is to multiply your age times your pre-tax household income from all sources and then divide that number by 10. The answer you get will suggest what ideally your net worth should be. Now, if your net worth is under this number, Dr. Stanley would consider you an under accumulator of wealth. And if your net worth is above this number, then you would be considered a prodigious accumulator of wealth. Again, let's throw some numbers into this. Let's say we have a 50 year old who has an annual income of $50,000. The equation would suggest that he should have a net worth of about $250,000. If he has a net worth that is less than this, he would be considered an under accumulator of wealth. Whereas if he has a net worth that is above and beyond this number, he would be considered a prodigious accumulator of wealth. You can also flip this formula to get a ratio. You take your net worth, divide it by your age, divided by 10, multiplied by your household income. If your ratio is one, you are an average accumulator of wealth. If the ratio is less than 0.5, then you're an under accumulator of wealth, and a ratio above two is considered a prodigious accumulator of wealth. If we use our previous example of a 50 year old with a $50,000 income, if he has a net worth of $100,000, he would be considered an under accumulator of wealth. With a net worth of $250,000, he would be considered an average accumulator of wealth. And with a $500,000 net worth, he would be considered a prodigious accumulator of wealth. 
It's important to keep in mind that this formula and these ratios don't really work well when you're early on in your career, and Dr. Stanley actually made note of that. This formula works best if you're, say, mid-40s and beyond. So for those of us who haven't yet hit this age milestone, but maybe you're still questioning, am I a prodigious accumulator of wealth? Maybe you could simply use one of the previous three suggested methods and see where you stand according to those milestones. And maybe if you exceed those milestones, you could still consider yourself a prodigious accumulator of wealth if that's something that's important to you. Ultimately, I think following any one of these general guidelines can put you in really great financial shape and set you up for financial freedom or a great retirement. But I do think it's important to remember that all of these are intended to be used as guidelines. No matter which method you choose to use, you're still going to want to personalize it and tailor it to your unique situation so you can hit your specific goals. Which one of these methods do you think is the most accurate to follow? Do you use any of these or would you consider using one of them? Before we end the video, I think it's worth noting that I find it really interesting that every single one of these guidelines uses your income as a guidepost rather than your expenses. Whereas so many of the astute personal financiers in this space are going to be quick to point out that it would probably be more appropriate to base it off expenses. A lot of times I feel like these financial institutions base it off income simply because so many Americans spend their entire income. So they use that number as the baseline. But if your expenses are less than your income, which they should be, it's more appropriate to base it off your expenses. So you could amend every single one of these and where it's asking you to put in your income, simply put in your expenses and you'd actually get a more realistic target. So I think that's perfectly fine to do. The goal isn't to die with the biggest bank account. The goal is to use your money as a tool to buy the life you want or give yourself the life you want. And ultimately that's going to be based off your expenses. I post new videos every single week. If you have anything at all out of this one, please give it a like. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. Or if you know of someone who might get something out of this type of content, please consider sharing. I'll see you soon. Bye.